Hi, it's me again. It is impossible to know just how many microbial species there are in the world. One recent estimate put the number somewhere around 1 trillion species and the vast majority of organisms still have yet to be discovered. But even with our relatively limited knowledge of the micro world, being able to identify microbes when we can is important from helping doctors diagnose their patients to guiding scientists through their observations. And sometimes the goals are a little less urgent, but still meaningful. Like for us, we collect these organisms and all of us on the journey to the Figmentum team who want to share what we've learned. We love showing off these organisms and the more specific we can get when we identify them, the more we can tell you about their lives. But even if we humans have only discovered a small fraction of all the microbes, there's still a lot that we have found and named. So figuring out, exactly, as in our samples can be difficult. It's like playing the board game, guess who? But first you have to solve a maze to find the right board. And even when you do find it, you realize you are playing with the largest guess who board ever, and still you can't be sure it even holds the answer, as we'll talk about later. Scientists have devised a number of molecular methods that make this ask less daunting, but we do things the old-fashioned way. We just look at the organisms. We collect our samples from nature, peering into an assembly of microscopic animals and single-celled creatures looking for clues in their morphology that will hopefully reveal they are. So come along with us, let's take you through some of the questions that help guide us through this process. The best place to start is to ask yourself in the broadest sense. What you were looking at? Is it multicellular? Is it a unicellular? You carry out a pro carry out. We'll start with the multicellular in part because they're generally a little easier to identify. There are fewer of them in total and their bodies just have more going on. And that means that there are more clues for us to find. Let's take the tartar grade as an example. But pretend that you don't know what tar grades look like. You went down to your favorite pond, gathered some water, and now you're looking at what you collected through the microscope on the other side. Is this delightful bumbling bit of life? You see some stubby legs waving around a pair of eyes and maybe some strange things moving around inside its body. All those details are helpful. Legs are a great clue as our eyes and inside the moving things you're watching seem a bit like organs. If you weren't sure that you were looking at a multicellular organism before you probably are now and beyond what you see. There's also what, you know, you know, that you got this little guy from a pond meaning a fresh after environment. That means you can rule out organisms that only live in marine environments. So what now you might be able to get help from a freshwater biology book. But if you're a hobbyist, those books might not be worth the cost. Luckily as old-fashioned as our methodology is we have a resource that the microbe hunters of you did not. The good old internet. A source, not just of cat pictures and arguments, but also of the many microorganisms that scientists and science enthusiasts like yourself have studied and documented. Sometimes all you need to do is just a simple search for something like freshwater microscopic animal and look through images until you find something that matches what you're looking at. Now, of course, a freshwater microscopic animal can bring up a whole range of species like rowers, hydros and gastric, but each of those animals is very different from the others, which can help narrow down what your unidentified microbial organism is and is not. If you find this process overwhelming at first, because you are trying to narrow down the vastness of the microcosmos to just one species that's okay. Every time you do this, you will get better at it. It takes years of practice and experience to figure out how to use all of the information available to you and pick out the most useful details. And like a baby tartar grade waving its legs for the first time, we all have to start somewhere with single cell. You carry out the process starts to get more difficult. You won't see the complex structures and systems that 
distinguish multicellular organisms, but you will see organelles that can help clarify what you're looking at. For example, one major clue can be picking out which organisms have those beating hairs called cellia versus which ones have more whip-like hair called flagella. And if you see the green color of chloroplasts, you know that you need to find an organism cap of photosynthesis. For example, what if you see the telltale trumpet morphology in your collection? Uh-huh, you might say that is a stent and you would be correct, but which stent? While stirs have varying numbers of micronuclei, these are hard to see without staining the macronucleus, however, is visible and can be helpful. For Steiner Karis, the macronucleus resembles beads strung together across the cell, which is called a Manila FORMM nucleus. Steiner polymorphus also has a Manila FORMM nucleus but it's easier to distinguish from the Steiner Karis because of the endosymbiotic algae that turn a green stent igneous by contrast is smaller and has pink pigments and contains an oval. Macronucleus stirs are a relatively easier genus to pick apart because there are only about 20 species of stirs to decide between other genera can have hundreds of species and the differences might be more. That's why sometimes you'll see our organisms labeled by the narrowest description. We feel comfortable giving whether that's identifying an organism solely by its genius or even going broader and just calling it affiliate. These are cases where we just don't know enough. Yet for those of you who remember our mystery real-time video, it took James a year to be sure of what organisms he was watching. And until he identified the mystery organism, we didn't know what was happening in that video. And of course it's even more challenging to identify bacteria. We can use morphology to parse out cyanobacteria and sulfur bacteria. But with most of the bacteria in our samples, it's just impossible to tell without genetic sequencing a technique that is not in our toolkit at the moment and for us that's okay. But there are cases where it's important to dig further and scientists have many molecular techniques to identify the microbes in their samples. There are stains to emphasize certain identifying structures and biochemical tests to reveal the presence of specific enzymes. Also, of course, there's gene sequencing and other more advanced chemical methods to probe what species a sample contains for James who does the work of identifying our microbes without these molecular tests. What he's able to name comes from years of studying and memorizing the drawings and pictures he's found in various books and keys, as well as an ongoing habit of reading papers every day. It's more a way of life, a habit born out of science, an art, a labor of love. Thank you for coming on this journey with us. Please like, share, and subscribe.